Hi, folks. Uh, super happy to be here. I'm jet lagged. I just lost my AirPods, but I'm still super excited. Don't worry. We're going to get through this. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about real-time React server components. Uh, I used to be on the React core team. No one talks about that. I made a CSS and JS library. We don't talk about that anymore. Uh, I worked in a bank. We just never talk about that. Uh, but for the past couple of years, I've been obsessing over this idea of stateful serverless for building like real-time multiplayer applications. Uh, I made a company called PartyKit. Uh, I just love the logo on that, by the way. Like, it looks way better than any other tech company. Uh, where we explored like building uh, interactive uh, drawing boards and uh, text editors and stuff like that. Uh, recently, I just got acquired back by my older company, Cloudflare, so I get to work in big tech again, so that's cool. Um, but le uh, let's start. Uh, what does a server look like? Not, not like a literal server. Like, how do you write code for a server? A very popular model is now pretty much like 95% of code, right? Uh, it doesn't matter which your provider is. You basically write a function that takes a request and sends a response. This is like the serverless model for uh, writing servers. And it's super popular. It's nice because you upload it to your provider. They put it on machines all across the planet. And any time a user makes a request, it finds the machine closest to them and responds to, uh, with the resp uh, it responds to it. Uh, and you can put whatever code you want inside this function. You can talk to a database. You can uh, talk to third-party APIs, LLMs, do auth, sessions, all of that. Uh, but there's a specific problem with this model that I'm not a fan of which is that it breaks our assumptions about the language itself, about JavaScript or TypeScript. Uh, let me explain what I mean. Imagine you want to build a hit counter, because it's, I don't know, 1998 and you need to put it on your blog. Uh, how would you write a serverless function for this? Ostensibly, because you know JavaScript, you would say, hey, let counter equals zero, and any time a request is made, increment it and send it back in the response. You're even going to test this locally, and it works just great. Every time you refresh the browser, it increments, and you push it out there, and it never works. It always returns zero. Why is this? Uh, it's because <laughs> serverless are the goldfish of servers. Uh, all your state gets wiped out uh, instantly as soon as it sends, sp spins up a response. It like spins up like a little process, returns your response, and goes back to, uh, and it just dies. And it does this for every request. Uh, it's quite annoying. Uh, because then the workaround is, OK, fine, we need to use a database or a key value store or Redis. And you end up building this hodgepodge stack for something that should have just been a JavaScript variable. Uh, and that's annoying. So the question remains, what if our servers were stateful? Some slightly older folks, myself included, uh, will remind you that this is just how we used to write servers before serverless. We used to actually have live node processes and used to run supervisors to keep them awake. But what does it look like in the serverless model? So Cloudflare, conveniently my employer, in 2020, they announced something called durable objects, uh, which is a new approach to stateful services. Uh, and the name is super exotic, but the idea is extremely simple, which is that for a given ID, and we'll talk about these IDs in a second, you should be able to write a class, a class that has a method on request that responds to uh, uh, that responds to requests. And for a given ID, it spins up an instance of this process and it keeps it alive. So this code, with a little bit of an API change, actually does work right now. So what are these IDs? An ID is something that you would associate with, let's say, a user ID, uh, or a user session ID, or a chat room ID. Anywhere where you want to build synchronization for like different people to connect and uh, do things. Uh, the counter example is OK, but a slightly more useful example would be if you wanted to build a chat room. Uh, so let's say for every slash chat slash ID using your routing library of choice, there's like one that we all use, uh, you maintain literally an array of strings called messages. And anytime you make a post to this request, you add to uh, the messages array. And if there's a get, you just return all of it. And this. This code is so wonderful because it matches the mental model of how you think about uh, chat code working inside a chat room. Uh, of course, no one is ever going to build a chat room with HTTP requests. Something a little more interesting would be, hey, what if we had methods like onConnect that got triggered every time a WebSocket connected to the server, and a method onMessage that got triggered for every message? You don't have to read all this code, but three interesting parts here are you can literally store an array of all WebSockets that connect to this, 
Uh, every time a WebSocket comes in, you just push it onto this WebSockets array. And any time a message comes into this chat room, you run a for loop on the WebSockets and distribute it to every WebSocket that's connected there. I love this code. Uh, if you have never had to build a real-time system in the past, uh, then this might look extremely normal to you. But the truth is, trying to build a chat room system right now involves an architecture that looks like this. I wanted to put 50 more green people there, but copy-pasting in Keynote is an absolute pain. Like, you don't want to do it. I gave up halfway, and I was like, oh, let, let me make it a little bigger. But the truth is that you want to, because you can't use regular serverless, you want to provision machines, you want to set up proxying, some kind of persistence, and you need to make sure that connections to a room end up in the same place. Durable Objects takes this architecture and instead flips it and says, hey, no, the, the, the infrastructure is going to give you primitives where you can implement something like this. So every chat room gets like its own process, and uh, everybody connects to it, and you can write simple code that just works. I wish the API was a little more complicated. It would make me look a little more uh, impressive, but it is what it is. Uh, so what can you do with this? Why is it even useful? Business logic is what it is. You want to be able to write code that does sentiment analysis, profanity checking, Anything, really. Uh, what I decided to give as an example of business logic is what if you could make every message into like SpongeBob case, uh, making everybody in the chat room sound sarcastic as hell. Uh, and it's something, because you're not using a PubSub system and it's a server authoritative model, it means clients can't opt out of it. No, like every message comes in, gets converted into SpongeBob case, and gets broadcast to everyone else. You should put normal logic inside there. Um, so, uh, you can actually build systems like this today with PartyKit. It's free for commercial usage since now it's a part of Cloudflare. Just pay Cloudflare usage. There are a bunch of starters. Uh, you can build chat rooms, and uh, we're going to keep expanding this list. My favorite is the text editor. It's actually a very complicated use case, which is just four lines of back-end code. So, what does this have to do with uh, server components? Uh, the thing that bothers me about server components ever since I started trying them out, and folks here who might have tried it out in Next.js or somewhere else, will know that you can't use state and context with server components. It just says, nope, those are client-side things. You might have a component, a very simple counter, and you say, hey, counter, set counter, you state, and on button, uh, you increment it by one. Uh, this won't work. Like, the compiler will throw and say, nope, you cannot import use state inside a server component. And what you have to do to work around it is to literally opt out the whole thing into a client component. And that's annoying, because I want to use like, the latest stuff. That's how people think I'm interesting and smart, like using the newer APIs. So what I really wanted was I wanted this programming model. I really want to use use state. I want to use state, and I want to use context. Hell, maybe I also want to use like server actions. Like, literally, inside the on-click handler, I want to say, hey, like this is happening on the server. Here, it's doing set counter. It might really be talking to a database, which already works. But I want it to work with a set state call. It's not just state. The other use case that I find that I really want inside server components is context, to be able to have a value that I share amongst a subtree. Uh, the thing that comes to mind uh, is, um, like a dark mode flag, but it can be a number of things. And it's complicated because client components might expect it, and you need to like serialize it down. So the workaround for this is to move it into client components. No, I don't want to do any of that. I want to use context inside my server components and have it just work. Uh, so where does that leave me? I wouldn't be here if I didn't have something to shill. Uh, I've been building something called React Party. Uh, I'm incredibly original by naming things. Everything has the word party, as you can imagine. Uh, and while it's not, I'm not releasing it to beta today, uh, you can actually bribe me during the after party and I'll give you access to the repo. And it looks great. It's exactly the API that I told you. It uses this serverless compute model to maintain state that lives, and it exposes it with hooks that just look like they're from React itself. It also gives you like a little server that you can extend. And if you squint at it, it strikes me that I've reinvented class components, but slightly different. Uh, but it works. You can like hack on it. it uh, you get access to all the web sockets, all the hooks like on connect, on it's like on start, on request. Uh, what is it good for? Well, I am I am here building a framework, which means uh, it's good for everything. You should probably rewrite all your applications with it today. No, truly, there are a number of new use cases that people are building every day now that it turns out it's a really good fit for. 
The things that come to mind are chat rooms. Everyone's building a damn chatbot nowadays, but you can make it multiplayer. Uh, collaborative tools, if you want to build the next Google Docs or Figma or um, what have you, like a linear, I don't know, anything that's like real time. You just want to have cursors on the page. You want to build a game server, so um, like trying to put a game out there online is something that can bankrupt you, and you don't really want that, but the stateful serverless model makes it as cheap as a regular serverless model. AI agents, so things that talk to LLMs and that are running in the background. Data grids, because I want some of that fintech money. And I like a lot more interesting real-time use cases. Instead of just worrying about CSS, I've decided to worry about money-making use cases now. So to recap, React Party should be out soon. It puts state and context in all your components, server components, client components. It uses WebSockets. All of this stuff happens on the server side, and it just sends component divs over, over uh, WebSockets. It's low latency, like around here I checked, and it's about 20 milliseconds to the closest Cloudflare pop, which is insane, uh, powered by this Global Edge network. If another provider comes up with a primitive like it, I will gladly make it work on Amazon for how much ever they charge you. Uh, there are no explicit network APIs. It's so nice writing code like this. You just write functions, and uh, you just call them. You get multiplayer for free. So the big question is, do we really need a new framework? I started building this a couple of months ago, and I started building like a CSS pipeline and like fast refresh, and I just hated it. But I was like, OK, if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. But I think over the last couple of weeks, I figured something out. I think I can ship this in Remix. I think if you give me like another month, I'll be able to ship it in Next. I'll definitely be able to ship it in Waku because I just love that framework and it's such a great community. And I also checked out the Redwood JS code and I'm like, okay, I can make it there. As you can imagine, I listed the four React Server component frameworks I know because I do not want to build a CSS pipeline. I'm going to try to make it work in existing frameworks so you don't have to rewrite your code. You can just start using use state and context. Uh, so that's mostly it. Uh, I wanted to end on a demo, so if you want to get onto that QR code, I love this example because this is something that would have taken a team and a lot of expenditure to build like one of these globes where everyone, like it shows you where in the world you're from. If you're on the live stream, feel free to like go in. This isn't live, I'll pop it open. But I'm super excited to learn what you people do with this. Uh, it feels like a new, it's so much fun to build applications this way, and I just can't wait to see like, what you folks do with it. I'm going to quickly see if I can open up that thing. Oh, look, there are like 200 people. Oh, wait, oh, you can't see it. Where do I? Not bad. There are like 200 people on this right now. It works. It's like a 100 line server and a 100 line client code. <laughs> Amazing. I want to hit like a thousand. Thank you so much. I saw Namai bringing the heat. React Kong 2020.